Okay, so we spoke last week about some of the main objections against the reliability of the Gospels, such as matters of authorship, bias, contradictions, when the Gospels were written, and whether they contain eyewitness testimony. I provided a few answers pertaining to Gospel contradictions. Uh, one is that even if there are contradictions and errors in the Gospels, Christianity is still true because Jesus rose from the dead. A second answer uh, that I provided is that we need to distinguish between a contradiction and a difference. So this week, I'm going to spend some all my time on looking at a new approach to gospel differences. All right, next slide. I did uh, eight years of focused research on this and published a book. Some of you have that book. It was published by Oxford University Press. Why are there differences in the gospels? What we can learn from ancient biography. And I'm going to tell you a little about that, uh, the process I took with that book. I can only get into so much during this 45-minute lecture, um, but uh, I'll just have to leave it to you to uh, read the book um, if you want more answers after this. Um, I'm also in the middle right now of writing another book on gospel differences that will be easier to understand than this one that you see on the screen. The one that I have already written is more academic in nature. The one that I'm writing right now will be easier to read and will deal with some of the questions that have come up since writing this academic book. Okay, next slide. Okay, so if you wanted to write a book about an important person, what genre would you use? Horror fiction, poetry, or biography? Well, next slide. You'd use biography, of course. Next slide. And if you were a biographer in the first century, writing for readers living in the first century, about a person who had lived in the first century, would you use the rules for writing biography that were in play in the first century or those that would not come into play until more than 1500 years later? Well, the answer is obvious. You would write it according to the rules that were in play in the first century. So the question we need to be asking is what rules were in play for writing ancient biography when the Gospels were written? Next slide. So that's what I sought to look at when I would do in the study. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of New Testament scholars today regard the Gospels as belonging to the genre of ancient biography. Now, in that book that I uh, showed a little earlier by Richard Burridge, What Are the Gospels? Um, he provides at least 10 qualities of ancient biographies that we likewise see in the Gospels. Let me just give you a few of them. I'm not going to go over all 10. In ancient biographies, the focus is on a main character rather than on an event, an era, or a government. When you're talking about if the focus being on an era, an event, or a government, that is a history. A biography focuses on a single person. And that's what we find with the Gospels. They are focused on Jesus. Second, we learn in an ancient biographies, we learn something about the main character's ancestry, and then we move rapidly along to the beginning of their public life. 
And when I say public life, that could mean as a politician, as a military commander, as a philosopher, as a religious teacher, whatever their public life was. Now, we learned something about this that's interesting that applies to the Gospels. Probably some of you have, many of you have wondered why the Gospels do not talk more about Jesus' childhood. In fact, after the infancy narratives in Matthew and in Luke, we only have one story of Jesus' childhood that Luke reports Jesus being in the temple when he was 12 years old. Other than that, we have nothing about Jesus' childhood. Why is that? Because the Gospels are ancient biographies. This is just how ancient biography was. They rarely ever talked about the person's childhood. Next slide. Ancient biographies were of the same general length. They tried to fit them on a single scroll, which typically would be somewhere between 10 and 25,000 words. Sometimes they could fit more on there. For example, in Philo's Life of Moses, um, written in the first century, there are nearly 31,000 words. So he may have just written with smaller print to fit it on a single scroll. But most biographies were typically 10,000 to 25,000 words. And the Gospels fit into this as well. Fourth, and this is very important, in ancient biography, the objective was for writing it was so that the main subject's character is illuminated through their words and deeds. Let me give you some examples of this. Next slide. This recognizing that the Gospels are ancient biographies sheds light on some theological matters. So, over the years, many skeptical scholars have said that the view of Jesus presented in each gospel evolves, that Jesus is not presented as being divine in Mark. We don't find that until Luke, and then in John, he's mentioned as being God. But when we read the gospels as ancient biographies, we find that Mark speaks of Jesus' divinity in crystal clear terms. I want to emphasize here or that Plutarch and others have said that the purpose of ancient biography is to illuminate who the main character is, to tell us something about this main character, the kind of person they are. So let's look at the Gospel of Mark, probably the first Gospel written. In chapter 1, John the Baptist is the prophet who has been predicted by Isaiah. He prepares the way for God, who ends up being Jesus here. Mark starts off his Gospel by saying, as Isaiah the prophet said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Well, you would think that it would be Jesus that would then be introduced, who would be making the path, preparing the way for God. Instead, it's John the Baptist who is preparing the way for Jesus. So from the very beginning of chapter 1, Mark is suggesting that Jesus is God. Then you come to chapter 2. Jesus forgives the sins of a paralytic and heals him. And the Jewish leaders there say that's blasphemy, because only God can forgive sins. That's right. So what's Mark saying about Jesus there? Next slide. In chapter 3, Jesus uh, cast out some demons. 
And the Jewish leaders say, well, Jesus is Satan casting out Satan. And Jesus answers them by saying that his exorcisms demonstrate that he has bound Satan and is plundering his kingdom of souls. Well, what human can bind Satan? What is that saying about Jesus? All right, next slide. In chapter 4, Jesus calms the wind. There's a storm, and he's sleeping. His disciples wake him up on the boat, and he comes out. He calms the wind, which is something the Old Testament says only God can do. Go to the next slide, please. Chapter 5, Jesus raises someone from the dead, which Ecclesiastes says this is something only God does. Now, I recognize that there were prophets in the Old Testament, and there were apostles in the New Testament, like Peter and Paul, who raised people from the dead. But they did so by praying and asking God to do it. Jesus did not ask God to raise people from the dead. He did so with his own word, his own powerful command. All right, next slide. Chapter 6. Jesus walks on water, which the Old Testament says it's something only God can do. Now, he allowed Peter to do it, but he allowed Peter to do it by having faith in Jesus. In other words, it's by Jesus' power. So it's still something only God can do, and Jesus was doing it in using his own power. Next slide. Chapter 9. Jesus' disciples have been trying to cast out a demon. They're unable to do it. Jesus comes, speaks the word, and the demon leaves. Later on, the disciples ask Jesus why they were unable to cast out the demon. And he says, this kind only comes out by prayer to God. Yet Jesus did not pray. What does that say about Jesus? Next one. Mark chapter 12, Jesus says he's not only David's son, but also his Lord. Next slide. Chapter 13, or I think there's a couple of them here, 12 and 13, Jesus teaches that he stands in a special relationship with God as God's son, who is above all prophets, priests, kings, and even angels. So he stands in this divine relationship, being God's divine son. Next one, chapters 12, 13, and 14. Jesus says he is the apocalyptic son of man, described in Daniel chapter 7, and we also find this son of man in 4th Ezra and 1st Enoch. It's a divine figure who is to be worshipped and served only as God is worshiped and served. So as we go through the Gospel of Mark, we see time after time after time that Mark is reporting the teachings of Jesus and the acts of Jesus that illuminate who he is. He is God's uniquely divine Son. He is God in the flesh. And we see this more more clearly by recognizing the Gospels as ancient biographies. All right, next slide. So if if most scholars today are correct, if they are correct that the Gospels are ancient biographies, by reading the Gospels in view of that insight can shed some great uh, light on our understanding of the Gospels. Ancient biographers took liberties in the way they reported things. Just as movies today often do not report the facts with great precision, and they are willing to change and alter some facts to make points more clearly and more powerfully, ancient biographers would do something similar. Next slide. I'm, I would be willing to bet that 
the differences between men and women and how they communicate in Indonesia share a lot of similarities with the way men and women communicate in the United States. Um, I've come to recognize there's a difference between what we call the guy and girl version of a story. Typically, girls like details and they like lots of details. They want to know what happened, when it happened, where it happened, why it happened, how it happened, who was there, what they were doing, what they were wearing, what they were saying, what they were thinking, and what they were feeling. Now, guys are different. We like just the facts. We don't care about a lot of details. We just want the bottom line. Tell us the story quickly and don't give us a lot of details. Well, ancient biographers would be different in the same kind of way. Some like to go into more details. Some like to give the guy version of the story. So let's look at some examples. Next slide. The way that stories or details would sometimes be changed in ancient biography are by the use of what we can call compositional devices. That's not a term I invented. It's one that is used by classicists who study the ancient Greek and Roman literature. Next slide. Something that's very important is what is called the compositional textbooks. Now, when children who were learning how to read and write in that period, when they reached their mid-teens, they received advanced training. If they were going to be, uh, you know, uh, more of the elite children or children who would go into being authors and historians and poets, they would enter the next phase of their education. And during that, they would learn, they already knew how to write. Now they would learn how to write well. And they made use of what were called compositional textbooks. And these textbooks had exercises in them to teach them how to write. Next slide. Theon is perhaps the first and oldest compositional textbook that we have. Theon probably lived in the first century. He wrote in Greek, and there were people who wrote these compositional textbooks before him. We just don't have them any longer. Here's something that he wrote about the, the textbook he was writing. We have not only invented some additions to the exercises as described by others, but also we have tried to give a definition of each. So Theon acknowledges that there were exercises, writing exercises that existed before him writing this book. So he is just carrying on the tradition. He's not there alone. And later in the first century, the Roman rhetorician named Quintilian also had exercises that he gave and he wrote in Latin. Next slide. Theon wrote, training in exercises is absolutely useful, not only for those who are going to be orators, but also if anyone wants to be a poet or historian, or if he wants to acquire facility with some other form of writing. These things are, in effect, the foundation of every form of writing. So whether one's writing history, or poetry, or eritology, or biography, whatever they're writing, 
these exercises are useful for those. Next slide. Theon talks about how to paraphrase. He writes, Paraphrase consists of changing the form of expression while keeping the thoughts. There are four main kinds. Variation in syntax, by addition, by subtraction, and by substitution, plus combinations of these. Next slide. Let me give you a couple of examples of how these work. Syntax means grammatical structure. So if we start with the sentence, today I heard Mike lecture, we can paraphrase by changing the syntax. And so it reads, next slide. I heard Mike lecture today. So I just changed the grammatical structure. The message is the same, but I have paraphrased it. Let's look at another example. Addition. Today I heard Mike lecture. We can paraphrase by adding the thoughts for clarification, and it says, next slide. Today I heard Mike lecture on gospel differences. So it adds and clarifies the thought. Next slide. Subtraction. Next slide. All right, are we, there we go. Instead of saying, today I heard Mike lecture, it just simply says, I heard Mike lecture. It doesn't give as much information, but it abbreviates the thought. Next slide. Substitution. Today I heard Mike lecture. You put some synonyms in there. Next slide. Today, I listened to Mike teach. So I replaced the word heard with listened, and I replaced lecture with teach. It says the same thing, but I've paraphrased it by substituting words. Next slide. Theon says, there are other ways of varying the content along the lines discussed in the chapter on narration. For example, recasting an assertion as a question, a question as a potentiality, and similarly, other forms of expression that we mentioned. So these are additional ways to paraphrase, and they're found in the chapter on narration by Theon. Next slide. Theon writes that narrative is characteristic of historians, and a history is nothing other than a collection of narratives. Next slide. So what I'm showing you here is that this is what people who were going to become historians and biographers were instructed to do when writing. He says, and this is on, this is Theon discussing narrative. Since we are accustomed to setting out the facts, sometimes as making a straightforward statement, and sometimes as doing something more than making a factual statement, and, and sometimes in the form of questions, and sometimes as things we seek to learn about, and sometimes as things about which we are in doubt. Next slide. and sometimes as making a command, sometimes expressing a wish, and sometimes swearing to something, sometimes addressing the participants, sometimes advancing suppositions, sometimes using dialogue. It is possible to produce varied narrations in all these ways. So Theon has just given us many different ways for paraphrasing and varying a narrative. All right, next slide. If we wish to use a dialogue form in a narrative, we shall suppose some people talking with each other about what has been done and one teaching 
the other learning about the occurrences. All right, let's look at some examples. Next slide. Oh, sorry, let's uh, look at a little more text before we go to examples. This is important to see. I want you to see what was being taught to people who would become historians and biographers and poets and whatever kind of literature they would write. Theon also said, thought is not moved by any one thing in only one way so as to express the idea that has occurred to it in a similar form. But it is stirred in a number of different ways. And sometimes we are making a declaration, sometimes asking a question. You can see he's just repeating himself here. Next slide. There is nothing to prevent what is imagined from being expressed equally well in all these ways. There is evidence of this in paraphrase by a poet of his own thoughts elsewhere, or paraphrased by another poet, and in the orators and historians, and in brief, all ancient writers seem to have used paraphrase in the best possible way rephrasing not only their own writings, but those of each other. So in summary, there's all these different ways to paraphrase and vary a narration. Historians, poets, all, anyone who wrote would do this to restate their own writings and the writings of others. So if it's true, as most scholars believe, that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source, we would expect them to paraphrase and to vary Mark's account a little bit, because this is what the biographers had been taught to do. Not only biographers, but all forms of ancient writing is what Theon says. There were others before Theon, there were others afterward. I'm using Theon because he wrote in the first century, the very century that the Gospels were written. All right, next slide. Let's look at a, just a, a few illustrations. So if I were to change a statement to a question, rather than saying, today I heard Mike lecture, I would say, did you know that I heard Mike lecture today? In other words, if let's say Mark sometimes presents Jesus saying something as a statement, Matthew or Luke might paraphrase it by restating it as a question. All right, next slide. Inflection. There are a few different ways to do inflection. But one way is to change a singular noun to a plural noun. So instead of saying, today Mike gave a lecture, you could say, today Mike gave lectures. Let's look at another way of inflection. Today Mike gave a lecture, you would change the um, part of speech. So lecture would be a direct object, but you could change that so that lecture becomes the subject. You communicate the same thought, but you change the part of speech it is. So today, a lecture was given by Mike. Instead of being a direct object, lecture becomes the subject. That's inflection. Next slide you could create a dialogue. So instead of saying, today I heard Mike lecture, you could say, you create the dialogue between two people. What did you do today? I heard Mike lecture. How was it? Great, I learned some of the reasons why the gospels often differ from one another. Next slide. Let's now look at some examples in the gospels. I said that if the Gospels are ancient biographies, 
we would expect to see the gospel authors to use some of these techniques for paraphrasing and narrative. Now, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness is reported in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but Mark only says that Jesus was tempted there. He doesn't give any details. The three temptations, as presented by Matthew and Luke, you have the first one is Jesus is hungry, so Satan tells him to turn stones into bread. The second one is different in Matthew and in Luke. Uh, they just have a different order. So one has Satan tell Jesus to cast himself off of the tallest part of the temple, and angels would catch him. And another one is that if he worshipped Satan, Satan would give him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, one thing we see here is that either Matthew or Luke varied the narrative by changing the order of the second and third temptation. So we might look at this and say, that's a contradiction. But remember, the ancients had different rules. They were taught to change and vary things. And so one of them did that. Here's another one. Next slide. Matthew, I, I don't know what it is like in Indonesian, but in English, the word bread can be singular or plural. Buy some bread at the store could mean multiple loaves or it could mean a single loaf in English. In Matthew, in the original Greek, um, Satan tells Jesus to turn these stones, plural, into bread, plural. But in Luke, it's all in the singular. Turn this stone, singular stone, one stone, into bread, a single loaf of bread. So one of them, either Matthew or Luke, has paraphrased by using inflection. They have either changed a singular noun to a plural noun or just the opposite. Next slide. Jesus tells the parable of the sower. In Mark, uh, it's, it says that the, the, the good seed, it falls on, the seed falls on good ground and it multiplies, it yields fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, when we read the same thing in Matthew, it's reversed in the order, 160 or 30 fold. I would guess that Matthew has changed this because in Mark, rhetorically speaking, to go from 30, 60, 100 builds um, an emphasis. It, it, it builds things up and makes it more exciting. So Matthew probably altered the order. And then when we read it in Luke, Luke just says 100-fold. All right, next slide. 100-fold, which means he has subtracted. He has abbreviated. Next slide. Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. All right, next slide. Here we find it in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. In all three Gospels, this story comes immediately after the story of Jesus' disciples picking grain on the Sabbath. So the differences are not because these are different occasions that are being described. This is the same story. So let's look at how it's been varied. Next slide. This is how it reads in Luke, and Mark reports it in the same way. On another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to the man with the withered hand, next slide, 
come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and disgust what, what, with one another what they might do to Jesus. Next slide. Let's read the same story in Matthew. Jesus went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? Here's where it's interesting. In Mark, they did not ask Jesus. They were asking it internally to themselves. They were thinking it but Jesus knew their thoughts. What Matthew has done here is he has paraphrased, he has varied the narrative by creating a very short dialogue. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Matthew has taken their thoughts and changed it so they expressed it verbally to Jesus, and then he responds. Next slide. And we can probably go to the next slide. Yep. Next slide. Let's look at the parable of the vineyard and wicked tenants. Next slide. This is found in Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 12, and Luke chapter 20. Mark and Luke are very similar, but Matthew is going to abbreviate. Next, next, you can see how Mark and Luke have three individual servants come on three different occasions and uh, that the vineyard owner sends them and say, the vineyard owner wants his reward now. You have to pay him. Whereas Matthew has the vineyard owner send all three at one time. Next. Then Mark says they sent many others, but Matthew reports that the second time the vineyard owner sent more servants than he had sent the first time. So you can see he has definitely taken three events and conflated them, combined them into a single event for that first one, whereas Mark and Luke spell them out. Next one. Finally, the wicked farmers kill the son. Next slide. After they kill the son, in Mark's gospel, Jesus says this, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. So in Mark, Jesus asks and answers his own question. Next slide. Matthew turns that into a short dialogue again. So we can see this is something Matthew does on more than one occasion. Jesus asks, so when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? By the way, also notice that even that question uh, that Jesus asks that we find in Mark, Matthew has paraphrased it by addition. He expands it some. And then they, the Jewish leaders, the scribes said to him, he will put those, mis those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit in their seasons. So Matthew has changed a statement into a dialogue, and he has paraphrased by addition both with Jesus's question and the answer of the Jewish leaders. We see this happening right before our eyes. Next slide, please. This is a very simple one. Jesus' baptism. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. And when Jesus comes out of the water, God's voice comes from heaven, and Mark, and in Luke, the voice says, you are my beloved son, in you, 
I am well pleased. But when Matthew reports it, the, God's voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Next slide. The difference is in Mark and in Luke, God is speaking directly to Jesus. But in Matthew, God is speaking directly to the crowd, the witnesses. Now, why would Matthew paraphrase in this sense? Why would he vary the narrative? Well, we can only guess, but if I had to guess, I would suggest that he probably did this to make it more personal to the readers of Matthew's gospel, as though God is speaking to them. He's telling readers that Jesus is his beloved son. Next slide. Jesus' disciples and Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road, and uh, later on they're, they're talking, but while they're on the road, the disciples are arguing with one another, one another about who's the greatest of them. And later on, Jesus asks them, what were you arguing about? And they were embarrassed, so they were silent. And so that's when Jesus puts a child in front of them and says, whoever wants to be great among you must be the least and servant of all and must believe like this child. That's how Mark reports it. When Matthew reports the same thing, next slide, he just simplifies it and has the disciples directly ask Jesus, which of us is the greatest? Now, I'm sure it happened more like it was with Mark. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't go up to Jesus and say, hey, which one of us is the greatest? Uh, when they saw how humble Jesus was. But Matthew just simplifies it. He tells the guy version of the story. Next slide. So this is, I believe this is my final, oh no, this is almost my final slide. But the insights we have gained through looking how ancient uh, writers were instructed to write and that the Gospels are ancient biographies and we can see how the Gospel authors wrote, we get some insights. We saw that ancient authors were instructed to vary the details. This was the proper way of writing. We also saw that the gospel authors followed this practice. We saw that the changes occurred in minor details. There are no differences in the gospels involving major details. And finally, we saw that the Bible does not inform us about the process of divine inspiration we observe that it involved the authors following the literary practices of their own time. In other words, divine inspiration included the literary practices of their own time. And I think that a problem happens when we try to read the Gospels as though they were written in the 21st century and use the rules that we use today. That's our mistake, not the gospel author's mistake. And if we want to understand how divine inspiration worked, because the Bible doesn't tell us how it worked, if we want to understand how it worked, we have to observe what's in the Bible and how the Bible follows these literary practices. It's called the phenomena of Scripture. All right, final slide, one more. If you want more information, I have more on this on my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, type in my name, Mike Lacona, and I've got over, over 200 videos. We have more coming out. Uh, subscribe and click on the bell icon so that you can be alerted every time we have a new video. I also have a website, risenjesus.com, that has some articles on it. Uh, that you may find helpful. So between the YouTube channel, the website, and of course, 
um, my book, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels, can uh, give you more information on this. Okay, I'm done.